Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Climate Leadership Series. I'm Leanne Osborne, Strategy and Planning Manager at the Climate Registry. We are so excited to build off of the momentum of our recent kickoff event that took place two weeks ago, and certainly in the lead up to what we all hope is a significant and meaningful COP26 in Glasgow. The moment for climate action is now. And we are pleased to continue our climate leadership series into the fall with webinars and workshops that are designed to give sustainability professionals like you the tools to act and to meet ambitious climate goals and hopefully leave you feeling inspired. Today's series is focused on meeting corporate climate commitments and we'll dive deeper into, into nature-based solutions to climate change. We encourage you to participate in the conversation, to connect with your colleagues and submit questions for our panelists. Please use the chat function to the right of your screen. Next to chat, you can use the people tab to search for and connect with your colleagues. If you require assistance during the event, please email questions at climateleadershipconference.org. Today's sessions will be recorded. You can access the recordings and all of our Climate Leadership Series sessions on the CLC YouTube channel. A shared link is coming your way early next week via email. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Climate Leadership Conference, we have convened sustainability professionals for 10 years running to address today's pressing climate challenges through policy, innovation, and business solutions. Now I'm turning it over to my colleague, Amy Bailey at C2ES. Hi, thanks Leanne. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Bailey, the Director for Sustainability and Engagement at C2ES, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Um, in partnership with the Climate Registry, we co-host the annual Climate Leadership Conference and Awards Program, and we're pleased to keep the, tra the tradition alive, albeit virtually this year. So we thank you for joining us today. We are grateful for the support as well of our 2021 sponsors. I wanna give special thanks to our headline sponsor, Bloomberg Philanthropies, our host city sponsor, Entergy, our platinum sponsor, Dominion, our gold sponsors, Intel and SoCal Gas. You can learn more about the great work these organizations are doing to support climate action by visiting the exhibit hall after our sessions to conclude today. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speakers, Lisa Jackson, the Vice President of Environment, Policy and Social Initiatives at Apple, will join her fellow former EPA colleague and our former C2ES President and now Senior Advisor, Bob Perciuseppe, in conversation about Apple's own climate commitments. So welcome, Bob and Lisa. I'll, I'll, I'll tee it over to you, Bob. Thanks, Amy. Lisa, it's great to see you across the country. Um, here yeah, in Brooklyn, hi. you're there in Cupertino. Um, let me just say a few more words about you and then we can get into our conversation. Um, Lisa, you may, you probably remember that the first time you and I met was at a state-of-the-art recycling center in Carteret, <laughs> New Jersey. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even now, you know, you're looking at materials management at uh, Apple in a big, in a big way. Um, and we both worked together, and I had the honor of being your deputy for the first term of the Obama administration. I'm not going to go into the long list of things we did, but I have a few memories that's worth mentioning, like, late nights working on regulations before uh, court order deadlines, all the way to getting up really early in the morning to worry about uh, an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, these were pretty crazy, but, but also uh, a really amazing work, I think, that you led and, and helped people like myself grow in, in terms of building inclusiveness in the work that EPA does. And, and so I really appreciated that. Um, so, Let's get on with uh, our conversation. It's really uh, great to have you uh, join us today. Thanks, Lisa, for coming. Oh, look, it's my pleasure, but uh, give me a second to acknowledge your role as administrator of the EPA, an organization 
we both love came up in in many ways and uh i learned so much from you you're humble as always but your leadership and your willingness to go toe to toe on really important issues um as administrator and of course as deputy uh but on your own and the accomplishments you made have protected human health and the environment for this country and around the world so thank you bob it's so good to see you thanks thanks lisa now in your new role, um, at, at not so new anymore, uh, at, at Apple, um, uh, you've been working really hard uh, on many uh, issues that are related to your entire career, all the way back to your your studies at Tulane and Princeton. So, um, and I want to throw in a quick congrats on once again being in the top 50 uh, influential women in business uh, on Fortune magazine. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, I Thank can you. never. I can, I can. I can never do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, uh, so um, you know, we have Glasgow coming up, uh, the conference of parties of the Rio Convention that uh, that uh, uh, Amy mentioned, and you know, in the lead up to that, Apple has been uh, doing a lot of work. But even before that. Apple has made the commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030. And so making major leaps in the near term on that is something that you guys recently announced. So why don't you uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you guys are doing in that regard? Because it involves supply chain as well as the communities you're working in. Yeah, we had an announcement uh, just yesterday that actually makes me so proud because you know, in order for us to see the kind of transition we need to see, it can't just be big companies. It actually can't just be companies. And we've been struggling for ways to make sure that this, this transition is as broad as it is deep, right? And so on the one hand, what we know we can do and have done is work with our supply chain to get them to switch over to renewable energy for their Apple production. Actually, many of them switch over to renewable energy, period. But what we work with them on is the work they do uh, for us and the products they produce for Apple. Um, so we're up to 175 suppliers now um, who have committed. That's um, over nine gigawatts of uh, clean energy coming on grids around the world, 24 countries to supply their needs because we want it to be additional clean energy. We don't just want to purchase existing um, uh, you know, megawatts or kilowatt hours that are already clean, because then you're just taking clean energy off the grid and there's no more for other people to use. And so we're really proud of that program. I think what's cool about it is that companies are you know, eager to sign up more than double um, the amount of companies, another hundred over the past year, and they're big and small. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of thing we have to keep driving. It can't just be the, the sort of largest companies. We all have to work in our supply chain. So that's uh, number one. But then number two is one that I know you'll love, Bob, because it's the kind of thing we it used to make the everyday work so great. And we call it um, power for impact. But the idea was we have small loads around the world where we could certainly go in and purchase renewable energy. Um, but we like to also add energy to grids. So we try to add those small loads in places and at locations where they can have a huge impact in a community. So a school, a hospital, um, you know, a place where the community can come and see storage or solar panels and understand and maybe learn. One of them is a school for sustainability. But, you know, in places where we have small, small loads like Nigeria, South Africa, Colombia. We have 10 Power for Impact projects. And I like that um, because we've been searching to ensure that the work we do also build some equity and climate justice into it. And this is our, um, this is our first attempt at these 10 projects where we're meeting our load needs by meeting community needs at the very same time. Yeah, I mean, I think you just hit all the key points there. Not only is it Apple as the company, but the people that supply you and the places where you work. Uh, and and uh, that, is, uh, that is that holistic look at, at that kind of global responsibility. And it's great that you guys are announcing and putting those forward in advance of the Glasgow uh, Conference of Parties coming up. Um, 
what, what, give me a, how about an example of something you're in addition to power is there other things in terms of materials that you might be working on in the supply chain well you're right we've never gotten i've never gotten far away from materials you know i started as an old super fun recycling uh, ma uh materials management that was how i started at epa um and so what that translates to for us at Apple is we are hardware manufacturers. I remember saying to you when I joined, one of the things I like about Apple is we make things. Uh, it is not just a virtual in the cloud company. And that gives us a chance to really practice the circular economy, this idea that the earth's resources are limited, that especially for certain materials like rare earth elements, you know, what makes rare earth elements rare is that they're in the crust of the earth, but they're at very small concentrations. So you have to churn a lot of material in order to get small amounts of these elements and they're needed for electronics. And so we're just really proud that, for instance, 100 percent of um, the, re the rare earth elements in our new uh, iPhone models are recycled. So we didn't have to, we're not drawing on the earth's resources. That helps to lower the carbon footprint um, of the new models, but it also really lowers the water footprint and sort of the um, material carrying capacity of that phone, right? Um, so we've committed to the circular economy. Tim Cook, our CEO, uh, committed that one day, we did not put a date on this one. We have 2030 for carbon neutral for our supply chain and our customers and our products. But he says, one day I wanna make all of our new products out of recycled or renewable materials. So we're not having to pull virgin material um, from, from the earth or out, um, out of communities. Um, I will just say, we know that there's a correlation. Um, it's not always direct, but you know the new, uh, iPhone 13 Pro has 11% reduction in its carbon footprint, in part uh, due to the use of recycled materials, because we don't have to count smelting and all the material transport. The new 16-inch um, MacBook Pro is 8% down from previous generations. So we know that we see that climate connection, but we also know it's the right thing to do just from a resource efficiency perspective as well. Yeah, I, and I think that that's a lesson for everyone because of virtually any industry uh, that makes things or uses things, you know, and has a supply chain for those things, you know, uh, you know, from plastics to to metals, uh, there's a huge opportunity to reduce the environmental input uh, impact and and the carbon footprint by using reusing materials that we've taken out. So let's transition here a little bit from Apple for a moment, and. And your thoughts, Lisa, on on these broader trends that we were just touching on in in the entire uh, industrial and and uh, business uh, sector in the world, and and the role uh, that businesses can be playing and are playing in helping motivate and move governments and mm -hmm. and the world toward uh, that sustainable future and and lower carbon uh, future. Yeah, uh, you know we. We lobby and advocate alongside our suppliers around the world. We have to. Um, yeah. The you know when we're outside of the United States, we're in markets like Japan or Vietnam, and we're saying, "Hey, if you want to get more of our business, we'll go with you to your government to say, hey, we need to be able to have more clean energy on grids so that our suppliers can access it. Give us a way to add clean energy to the grid that makes economic sense. Because clean energy is cheaper. It's just if you put too much administrative uh, hooks and, and ornaments on it, then it becomes more expensive. So we're, we advocate a lot for clean energy. We advocate in this country uh, for, you know, we were the first company to come out for the clean energy standard, which sort of morphed into the pieces of the Buy Back Better plan that everybody's talking about uh, as we speak here this very minute. Um, and we've said for over two years now that we think we need to have a way for the economy to price carbon so that business can get uh, engaged in this, in this fight in a real way. In the absence of those things, because I know that we may be facing a future that's not going to have all the pieces right now, it's more important than ever that businesses step up to the plate. 
Um, we're trying to do everything we know how to not just green ourselves, but to green our supply chain and help our customers access clean energy. And we'll keep doing that. Um, and I think uh, I get a lot of questions about green uh, efforts where the words don't match the deeds or where the deeds don't match the words. And I think that's where the role of the climate registry and C2 ES can, is so important because you can help people re, you know, understand what are real efforts and what are yeah. less real efforts, I would say. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the work that you're doing in the, in the communities around the world that you're working on your, your 10 projects. What, what do you, what do you think might come from some of that that can be tra that can be learned by other companies in in terms of, or or the private sector in general about the communities they work in and their need for resilience and 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 attention due to their potential for disproportionate impacts due to climate change? Yeah, look, I I think it's really important. I I don't want to say that other companies aren't doing great work. Of course they are. So mostly I should talk about us. But what I love about these projects is that we tied the need to address climate change, which for many communities feels like something either far off or yeah. happens in the developed world, yeah. uh, happens in the U.S., happens in Europe. And it's a it's a problem created and solutions created for the U.S. and Europe, maybe a few, you know, a few other locations around the globe, not to uh, not to list every one. What we're trying to say is, you know, the solutions that we're trying to impact are actually great solutions for communities who want to embrace them. How do we bring these solutions to life in Colombia? How do we bring them to life in parts of Africa so that people see what they see on their everyday ledger is, oh, wow, we now have a school that is running and can take more students because they don't have to pay for energy, which is super expensive. Um, that's that's a real tangible benefit to addressing climate change that goes beyond the big benefit of one and a half degrees C or uh, addressing uh, you know changing uh, uh, water and and hydrology patterns. I want to bring up one other because I know you're going to talk about natural solutions. Um, I don't want us to leave that out. Um, yeah. You know we have another wonderful project we announced last year in Colombia. Um, we do it in partnership with Conservation International. It's a 27,000 acre mangrove forest that we're working to preserve on the Suspata Bay uh, on the Caribbean coast of Colombia. Um, and I love that project because on the face of it, we're looking at the stored carbon, the negative carbon that we get from preserving that, but what Conservation International calls blue carbon in those mangroves. But the community is looking at resilience. We got to engage the local groups in the restoration of those mangrove forests. And that protects their livelihoods because many of them make their living in those mangrove forests um, as fishermen. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I think, I think every business can look at its need for clean energy around the world and say, how do I connect my need for clean energy with community solutions? And then I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful story, of course. We all love wonderful stories in business, but it's a wonderful result that connects climate change solutions to community in a really tangible way. Yeah, our, our next panel that's going to follow us here is going to talk a little bit more about the natural solutions. But let's, uh, you know, you've brought it in here. and let's, let's keep talking about it a little bit, because I think, you know, when you look at aviation all the way to your own company, you know, getting rid of all impacts is going to be difficult. And so the question is, how can you um, enhance the absorption of carbon mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere? Uh, you know, the Paris Agreement says bring the bring into balance the anthropogenic emissions and the sinks, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, to get a net zero. I mean, that's the actual uh, words of the uh, of the Paris Agreement. It doesn't talk about any particular kind of energy source or anything else. And so um, how do you see that working in your own plans? I mean, how do you see the, um, the nature? Here's where I think the big, the big idea could be the nature based solutions, preserving habitat and building resilient communities. And at the same time, helping, uh, you know, 
uh, bring that balance of, mm -hmm. of sources and sinks. Uh, how do you see that working, you know, in the, in the Apple plan? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we estimate, we have a plan to get us to 2030, you know, it's called Apple 2030 inside the company. It's a big deal. We check in on it regularly and report on it um, with the big boss uh, quite regularly as well. But we estimate 75% of getting the carbon neutral will come through emissions reductions. But 25%, at least as we sit here today, and it is associated with things like logistics, there's also some direct emissions of CO2 in industrial processes, um, not related to energy use, that, but, but you know, uh, greenhouse gases are emitted as part of the process that at least today we don't have an alternative. So say 25% of our footprint, which is what, 24 million metric tons a year, we are going to need to offset at least sitting here today in 2021. And so what we've also done is something that we call the Restore Fund. We said, why don't we try to pilot an investment vehicle where a company like ours can invest in a financial fund that pays returns in two ways. The first is the standard way, the fund makes money. So if I put in a dollar, I get more than a dollar out. But the second way is it also has to provide um, a carbon sink. It has to provide a return in the form of carbon that's stored in nature. So it's nature-based. Um, right now, the, the Restore Fund has been focused on working forests, not forests that become parks and beautiful natural spaces like you've worked on so much of your career, but actual working forests because we need growing trees um, and lumber and wood products those are all ways to sequester carbon out of the air. Uh, trees take carbon out of the air as they grow. We can count that um, as part of our offsets for emissions that we can't we can't cut down. But the idea was if we can if we can make it profitable financially, then everyone would want to do this. Yeah. If I could get a return for doing it, wouldn't everyone? And the last piece is what you brought up, Bob. It can't just be profitable plus carbon negative, it has to be community positive. Right. So there's lots of worry today about indigenous people, people whose lands could easily, as part of carbon solutions, be taken um, away from them, away from their control. And so we're very clear um, with uh, our partners who manage the fund that we want to see projects that are community positive. Uh, and that's Goldman Sachs, by the way. They are the manager of the actual fund. Um, and that's, you know, that, that means that there are projects we're going to have to turn down. And to be frank, right now, there aren't enough projects uh, to invest in because we would like to invest a lot more than 200 million. But we started small because we don't want to we, we don't want to put money out there that we can't spend. Yeah, no, I, that makes tons of sense. And everything you just said. So. What are the, what do you see as some of the barriers here on this on this part of this of this part of the the plan not just your plan but probably the plan for carbon neutrality for the entire global economy it, what what barriers are you seeing or solutions to to meet make things go faster yeah two two things we see so far the first of course is uh, data transparency and uh, accurate numbers around yeah. carbon sequestration. I think this whole thing falls apart if people, investors, but uh, also communities come to believe it's kind of built on smoke and mirrors. And so yeah. you need rigorous science. That's why we partnered with Conservation International. They're the other partner in the Restore Fund. So on the science side, we have, uh, we have their extraordinary talent out there making sure that these are real projects that are um, that are actually removing carbon that otherwise would not have been removed. So it's additive carbon removal. The other side though is scale. Um, it, to find those wonderful projects requires extraordinarily dedicated conservationists, ecologists, scientists, uh, in some cases, extraordinarily, extraordinarily brave uh, ecologists and scientists um, who are out working in communities to help communities preserve and protect um, 
say a working forest or grassland, or of course the next frontier will be agricultural land, where which has a tremendous opportunity yeah. to sequester carbon. Um, and so in order to get the projects that we love done the right way, to have more mangrove projects, which we're so positive about, we need scale. And so one of the reasons we put the $200 million fund together, and I think hopefully others will, will do similar, is it's supposed to be a strong signal to the marketplace right. to go out and create these kinds of projects. The danger is if another company comes along and isn't rigorous about the carbon removal, isn't rigorous about community enhancement, you can have a lot of money going towards projects that aren't um, either aren't viable, aren't good, or create injustice um, along the way. And that's th those to me are the three biggest dangers, if you will, of doing this yeah. uh, incorrectly. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, if there's going to be private capital flowing into these nature-based solutions, uh, there has to be confidence. Um, and so that's a key. And I, I hope, uh, you know, some of the work that you guys are doing will help build the, the body of knowledge uh, with organizations like Conservation International and others, including your own technical people. I wouldn't say that Apple is not technically astute. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, you know, to, to help move the, move the, move the ball forward. Yeah, you know, this is going to be a subject uh, among many of our next our next panel. Um, uh, one final question before we have to get off. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, Lisa, is, uh, ha have you been paying attention to Glasgow uh, in your role and 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 keeping uh, keeping the rest of the leadership team there informed on what you think what might be happening? And if you have any thoughts on on this another pivotal moment, you know, in the in the in the move in the march forward to uh to get the world to address climate change yeah absolutely i, I mean i don't think it, it it's telling tales out of school that literally this morning right before this call i walked in and talked to my boss the ceo about what happened uh overnight in washington dc because of course what happens in dc is what the president and um envoy kerry and um uh, bring into Glasgow for our country. Um, and, and you know, we wanted to know where we are. For a while, we were hearing that, you know, business might be the best news that was going into Glasgow from the U.S. side. I think that that's potentially changing quickly, and that's great. Um, but, yeah, we care. I'll tell you, like, the most immediate, most... Uh, easy way to make that connection from my standpoint where I sit today, not where we sat nine years ago or 10 years ago, uh, where we've been a very different, I, I'm still remembering going to Copenhagen and making the endangerment finding, Bob. I mean, that's probably one of the highest points of our career, right? Um, but uh, sorry to, to digress, but it's, back, it's to okay. Apple, <laughs> back to Apple. <laughs> Um, we have made a commitment that we want all of our customers to be carbon neutral by 2030 when they use our products. We would greatly prefer that the way our customers get there is by plugging into clean grids around the world. So yeah. the more work that government leaders do to really push our grids to be cleaner, the less work business has to do on something that frankly is the hardest for us to do. Uh, we love working with our customers, but they deserve the same access to clean energy that we get every day. We can plug into it. And so we care a lot about uh, watching what happens with the grid over the next 10 years because we've made this commitment and it's a lot easier to meet with, with clean electricity coming on around the world. Well, we'll see what happens. And Hopefully, uh, there's a little bit of momentum out of uh, out of Washington, although it's been hard to come by. And so we'll all keep an eye on that. So, Lisa, um, I'm hope you know we when you and I started talking about having this conversation, we were hoping we'd be together in uh, in New Orleans, your hometown. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so um, I'm hoping that sometime in the next year we'll be able to catch up as uh, perhaps we get more uh, more people uh, vaccinated and we can move forward. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for everything you've done before and now with uh, Apple and uh, keep up the good work. And uh, I'm, now, 
I'm now going to turn this over to Jen Kaminsky, who will uh, lead us into the next uh, session. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bob and Lisa. Really appreciate your time today and for sharing your insight with all of us. I'm Jennifer Kaminsky, Director of Outreach and Communications at the Climate Registry, and I'm happy to introduce our next conversation, which focuses on the critical role that natural climate solutions play in meeting corporate commitments. We know that nature-based solutions are gaining traction as a key ingredient for addressing the climate crisis. Business leaders will share how, how exactly, they're integrating nature-based solutions into their portfolio of reduction measures, some of the emerging trends they're observing, and the co-benefits of investing in these projects. We're dedicating time to answering your questions, so please use the chat function on the right side of your screen to ask away. With that, I'd like to introduce Stuart Lindsay, Managing Director, Corporate Engagement, at the Nature Conservancy, who will facilitate our discussion. And with him, his fellow panelists, David Eichberg, Global Head of Climate Action at HP, Altera Hetzel, Vice President, Client Solutions at Natural Capital Partners, Andrea Smith, Sustainability mm -hmm. Program Manager for UPS, and Natasha Tuck, Director of Sustainability and ESG for VMware. Welcome. Uh, delighted to be here and to moderate today's panel. Uh, we'll start by framing for just a couple of minutes the topic, then we'll dive into what will certainly be a, a vibrant conversation. We're all here because natural climate solutions are an important tool for tackling climate change, and they're a growing part of corporate climate strategies. Uh, this is a fast moving space with no doubt, and there's also some degree of uncertainty and challenge. Heading into COP, it's a timely uh, to unpack this topic with a panel of experts from leading organizations. My name is Stuart Lindsay. I'm the Managing Director of Corporate Engagement at the Nature Conservancy. We're a global environmental organization and our conservationists, scientists, po public policy experts and other colleagues work to protect, restore and manage the land and water on which all life depends. And by doing so, we strive to enhance biodiversity, reduce emissions, and benefit communities. We've been active in the NCS space for quite some time, uh, both on the ground uh, and working with other organizations on enabling conditions. So a couple of facts. The potential of NCS really can be expressed in a few statistics. A few years ago, TNC did, led some science that showed that about 20 NCS pathways, things like reforestation, ag and grassland practices, wetland, re wetland restoration, could achieve about 30% of the cost-effective CO2 mitigation we need to, need to do by 2030. Uh, one other statistic, nearly half of the high-impact climate solutions measured by Project Drawdown involve natural climate solutions. And one more, NCS projects represent a majority of potential new supply for global carbon markets. And this is according to the Task Force on Scaling Voluntary carbon markets. So there's a lot of potential here. Uh, this is great for a variety of reasons, but uh, in, in no small part because nature has been undervalued for far too long. And the consequences of this have been really nothing short of tragic. Uh, scientists estimate that species extinction around the world is, is happening about a thousand times faster than it would naturally. Uh, and deforestation and land use change, as we all know, contribute a significant uh, amount of, of the emissions every year, about 10%. Uh, to look at this from another angle, the gap between what the world needs to spend to protect biodiversity and what it is spending is approximately $700 billion a year. Um, so stronger engagement, and new investment from the private sector in NCS, if done in the context of ambitious reductions uh, with an emphasis on credible science, on transparency, social benefits, community engagement, this could really be a powerful tool for change. And it could help us meet climate goals and, and do so much more. Now, the good news is that there's quite a bit of momentum in the private sector. Uh, last I checked, 965 companies had made a 1.5 degree commitment by SBTI. We've seen a big jump in net zero commitments from the world's leading companies. And over 200 companies have signed the climate pledge. So we're seeing 
commitment. We're seeing investment in innovative products, we're see projects. We're seeing engagement in standard setting, and we're seeing companies support science. Um, we've noticed this at TNC, whether it's in the form of doing a new agroforestry project in Brazil with Amazon.com or creating new investment concepts with a variety of different partners. Um, and I know we'll learn quite a bit more about new efforts uh, by our panel today. Now, that's all good, but there's a long way to go. The, if you notice the just released State of Climate Action Report, indicators on land use and coastal uh, management are, are declared off track. Uh, and there are a lot of questions out there. Can we do enough high quality NCS projects? Can we do them in the world's most valuable and vulnerable ecosystems? Can we do them with communities who stand to benefit the most? Will standards and measurements be credible and practical enough to support real impact and also create a vibrant marketplace? Can we move quickly enough? Can we ensure that NCS represents a complement to ambitious reduction, not a substitute? Uh, we have a great panel to address these and, and, and a number of other questions. I'll kick it off. We'll ask a, a round of, of, of questions to the panel, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. So please insert your questions, if you haven't already, into the, uh, into the system, and we'll try to take as many as we can. So let's start off. We'll ask a question for all of our panelists. Natasha, if we could start with you, and then we'll pass it to Andrea, to David, and to Altera. Um, each of your organizations has set long-term emissions target or is engaged in helping achieve such targets. Uh, in a couple of minutes, could you give us a snapshot of how your organizations are tackling climate and how NCS fits into your broader strategies? Sure. Hi, happy to be here. So VMware started its carbon neutral journey in 2015, and we've been a certified carbon neutral company since 2018. We also procure 100% renewable energy for our operations. And last year we announced our goal for net zero by 2030 alongside our 2030 agenda. So from the start, our strategy has been to take action wherever we can and plan for the future. So with that in mind, I wanna start with, you know, reducing emissions internally. So certainly that's where we start and we've been working hard to, you know, with energy efficiency projects and the like across our real estate and our data centers. Um, but for us, the biggest part of our footprint is our supply chain. So this year we launched a res responsible sourcing program and they're actually working with all of our suppliers on their science-based target journeys. So that's a bunch of work that we're doing internally. And of course it starts there. And with the commitment to net zero, we have, created a 10 year model to the extent that we can forecast out emissions. Um, we know there's no crystal ball, but we're looking at what our emissions could look like in 10 years. And with a, with a hybrid strategy of carbon avoidance offsets and carbon removal offsets, planning on how to get to net zero. And over the last many years, we've participated in lots of carbon offset projects given our carbon neutrality um, certification but we are looking over the next few years to incrementally sort of give a heavier weighting, if you will, to the carbon removal projects, certainly those that are out there um, and nature-based solutions in particular. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. I think take action wherever we can and plan for the future really uh, is, a, is a great single sentence summary. That's, that's fantastic. Um, if we can hand it to Andrea. Absolutely. Thank you for having me to my esteemed panelists. Uh, pleasure to be with you all today. Andrea Smith, UPS. Uh, UPS has a presence in 220 countries and territories. We operate a fleet of 125,000 ground vehicles, 500 planes. So for UPS, GHG emissions is among our most material sustainability issues. With that, we have a goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. But just as under um, Natasha spoke to reducing emissions internally, folks, we, first, we understand that action must be taken today. So our focus is on decarbonization. Um, to support that 2050 goal, we've set a short-term goal of by 2025 being 40% alternative fuel. And that is fuel that is from a source other than your conventional diesel and conventional gasoline. To support this goal, we also 
have an eye on electric vehicles and electric vehicles will play a major role in UPS's sustainable fleet. And we have made agreements to support that, including a commitment to purchase up to 10,000 um, electric vehicles from Arrival, which is an EV manufacturer out of the UK. But also we're supporting um, natural gas vehicles and have made investments in our natural gas fleet with an eye on fueling these natural gas vehicles with renewable natural gas. In the air, sustainable aviation fuel isn't yet scalable. So what we're doing in the meantime is we are and have been working on the efficiencies of our aircraft and ensuring that we are burning as less fuel as possible. Uh, so we believe that it's important to reduce before moving on to offsets. But once we've made those reductions, then that's where we bring in these natural capital solutions that we'll speak to today. Great, thanks so much. Some some really uh, important uh, wedges there that you're talking about in terms of uh, transportation fuels. So uh, look forward to hearing more. David. Stuart, thank you. Um, and thank you uh, to C2ES, the Climate Registry, and Bloomberg Philanthropies for continuing to put on this great conference year after year and the opportunity for uh, for HP to share and learn today as well. So at HP, of course, you know we recognize the urgency of the next decade to address climate change. And our climate action strategy focuses on three areas, carbon emissions, circularity, and forests. And in particular, that is to dramatically reduce GHG emissions in line with the latest climate science and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But in addition, we need to transform production and consumption from linear to circular models and to address the depletion of natural resources and the emissions resulting from that. And thirdly, to protect and restore and sustainably manage forests to reverse the loss of biodiversity, ecosystem services, and to empower local and indigenous communities. And this past April, HP announced some of the tech industry's most aggressive and comprehensive climate action goals. Uh, and that included reducing our scope one, two, and three GHG emissions by 50% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2040. And very much like uh, Andrea and Natasha have talked, the focus is on reductions first. The focus is on, again, our operations are a very, very small portion, but Renewable energy, 100% renewable energy, electricity by 2025, um, all electric vehicles in our fleet by 20, um, in HP zone and operated fleet by 2030, um, and carbon neutral neutrality in our own operations by 2025. Um, but we need to drive this, as Natasha said, deep within the supply chain. It has to be across our product design. It has to be across uh, how we drive service models to enable reuse as well as sustainable materials um, in product transportation um, and, um, uh, and, and further on. But there's also this important element of forests and we have a goal to eliminate or to counteract deforestation that's associated with both HP and non-HP brand paper that's used in HP products and print services by the end of the decade. Because at HP, you know, our business is inextricably linked to forests through the paper that's used in, in our printers as well as packaging. And thriving working forests are maintained, um, are managed according to you know, the principles of sustainability are gonna be essential to our business in the long term. And just this week on Tuesday, HP announced an $80 million partnership expansion with the World Wildlife Fund to restore and protect or improve the management of nearly a million acres of forest landscapes. That's about the si five times the size of New York City. And with this partnership, HB becomes one of the first technology companies to counteract the risk of deforestation beyond our own supply chain and accounting for the impact on nature of all paper that's used in our printers, regardless of the brand. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. It's it's really refreshing to hear that straight on approach about uh, deforestation. It's such a vital topic. Um, Altera, could you uh, finish us off with this first question? Sure thing. So hi, everybody. Thanks for having me and thanks for leading, Stuart. Uh, I'm Altera. I'm with Natural Capital Partners, but I should probably also say I'm with Climate Care because we recently merged together. Um, our combined company helps over 500 
clients meet their corporate sustainability goals and take action on climate, um, including those on this panel, HP, VMware, and UPS. Um, often that is anchored in our carbon neutral certification or carbon neutrality today, but certainly as companies are thinking about what they need to do today, as well as what they want to do in the future, whether that's tracking toward net zero goals, forest positive goals, nature positive goals, offsets have a role to play. Of course, after all these good reductions that we've been talking about um, have been planned and achieved. Um, and in that space, it's kind of across the board. You know, Natasha men mentioned removals, those reforestation and afforestation projects that are trapping carbon. Um, but to David's point, we also need to protect the forests that are currently intact um, and ensure that we're taking conservation measures and avoid um, additional carbon emissions. So I'm just really excited to be sitting here with these great companies and great clients and um, have done some really good work on the ground in forestry um, through improved forest management projects with the Nature Conservancy. So really happy to have you as well, Stuart. Thanks so much, Altera. Um, so I'll ask a couple questions now. We'll just direct them to one or two of you in the panel. Um, we'll cover a couple different topics, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, let's start with you, Andrea, and then we'll we'll pass it to Natasha. We know that uh, nature-based solutions do more than just remove carbon. They often have a, a significant number of co-benefits. Um, and they're increasingly important for climate resilience. So how is UPS evaluating and tracking the co-benefits of the work it does in the NCS space? Yeah, and thank you for that question. Um, I spoke earlier to UPS's decarbonization for our own operations, but what we do offer in the offset space is an opportunity for our customers to offset their emissions produced through movements with UPS. Um, just as um, Natasha and David spoke to the supply chain, we understand that we are an important part of our customers' supply chain. So we'll partner with them in their carbon neutral goals to reduce their scope three emissions or that with associated with purchase transportation. In this effort, more and more companies are looking for projects around nature and carbon removals, in addition to aligning their projects with the SDGs. So there are co-benefits across all SDGs, uh, not just the nature-based ones that we're speaking to today, but specifically we're seeing a market increase in those or the request for projects that are aligning, aligning with gender equality. So we're working with partners such as Natural Capital Partners, on ensuring that our projects offer those co-benefits cool that are growing more and more among our customer requests. That's, that's, that's very interesting. The demand signals that you're seeing out in the marketplace are, are, are important and it, it'll be interesting to see how that, that tracks over the coming years. Natasha, how are you all looking at it? Yeah, and first let me let me rewind a bit because I realize I didn't give an intro to VMware. <laughs> and I often say that VMware is the largest tech company that no one's heard of. So in case you're not familiar, we develop software. We're a multi-cloud company that enables our customers to use any app on any device from anywhere. And essentially you can think of us as the plumbing within just about everybody's at this point, IT infrastructure. So that leads well into how I would resp respond to the co-benefits question, um, because from the start, they've been an important part of our journey. So because we can relate to being that, that plumbing or that foundation, we have always invested in projects that have those multiple co-benefits, because we think that by laying that foundation in communities, that it really enables those communities to be strong and resilient and to thrive. So whether it's eliminating the need for additional wood to be cut down as a result of a smart water filter to economic development through training local folks and communities to uh, deploy clean cook stoves or do leak detection, these are all co-benefits that have a huge impact. And we also, like Andrea said, we um, align ours to the sustainable development goals. And we also talk about those co-benefits uh, when we talk about the projects. Great, thank you very much. Um, great contributions. So we've heard quite a bit about how NCS is embedded into these strategies, the importance it has, but um, this is not a, a, a space 
without some challenge. Uh, so perhaps we could unpack that a little bit. Uh, Altera, from your vantage point, what do you see as the biggest challenges to scaling up NCS and what headwinds are you seeing out there in the market? Yeah, I mean, if I was just going to like put it simply and bluntly, um, we need money and time. Um, as we're thinking about developing natural capital solutions or nature-based solutions, we have a considerable supply and demand issue going on. With all of these commitments coming out, we need to make sure that the projects are in place to meet the demand of the future um, now, 2030 and beyond. In terms of money, um, quite frankly, we need money to get seedlings, to get trees into the ground, um, to make sure that they're monitored and they have a high survival rate, to do that important community engagement work and stakeholder engagement work that needs to happen on the ground to ensure that the local communities are good stewards of these projects. Um, and then, you know, and this, is, this is literally not rocket science, but it takes time for trees to grow. And so there's going to be a little bit of a delay when the capital needs to be injected into the market to when those projects are actually delivering outcomes in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, so I know it's gonna be a challenge. Um, it's gonna be a different market, at least from the offset perspective than what we've seen before where credits are just issued and kind of spot purchased. There's probably gonna need to be more of a three-pronged approach where companies are looking to purchase those credits that are on the market today, maybe looking to secure forward strips of those credits for future issuances in the coming years but then also injecting capital into project development and project expansion to ensure that those uh, inventories are gonna be avail available to draw from in 2030, 2040, and 2050 to meet all these awesome goals. Time and time and or money and time, David, does that, sound, does that sound right to you? Would you add anything to, to Altera's comments? I, I, well, time is not on our side here, right? Um, but I, I guess I'd add uh, to Altera, I, I agree it, it's a, um, there's a quantity and there's a quality issue, right? So alongside the old adage that, you know, you manage what you measure is one that not everything that matters can be measured, certainly not easily, right? And this is often the case with uh, natural climate or nature-based solutions, given you know, the vast range of factors that are involved in natural systems. Even a quantify a ton of carbon sequestered in a, you know, in a given forest area um, can be somewhat tenuous, you know, and hence the need for rigorous and high quality standards. It's, it's not rocket science, but you know, it is forestry science. So it, it, HP and WWF, now we're with this new partnership, we're setting a new bar for nature-based solutions that are gonna benefit nature, climate, and people with, a partner, with this partnership providing a much needed credible counterpoint to criticism that's focused on certain nature-based solutions that lack rigorous methodologies or social safeguards. And so we're recognizing that challenge at the start of the project. Together with WWF, we'll be using a rigorous science-based methodology in both the design and the implementation to estimate forest footprints and on the ground approaches to calculate carbon and other nature benefits through our investment. This is a methodology that um, is one that WWF developed through our work in um, identifying science-based targets for forests to estimate that impact on nature from the sourcing of um, land-based commodities uh, like you know, hardwood, of course. And HP will be the first company to rigorously now apply this methodology and the models that are developed with this will help to identify key regions of the world for forest conservation and then better estimate carbon in nature benefits from forest actions. So we're helping to advance this movement to really ensure that nature-based solutions are informed by the best available science and, and protecting co-benefits that forest ecosystems provide to people and plants and animals. So that, that's really fascinating, and, and I love your comment. Not everything that matters can be measured. Certainly, not everything that matters can be measured uh, affordably today either. So, if you if you're working on methodological innovation, stick with this just for a second and tell us more about what other innovative areas you think are are the most exciting or have the most potential. And then we'll ask the same question of Natasha. So, I. I think it's really in this area I mentioned before, forging ahead, you know, beyond one's own, even one's own boundary and one's own supply chain. HP 
was one of the few companies in the world to achieve a zero deforestation goal for the sourcing of our own paper and packaging. And last year we achieved we achieved that for 99% of HP brand paper and paper-based packaging with the remaining 1% being assessed to ensure that the reported fiber usage would meet our sustainable paper and wood policy. And then, as I mentioned earlier this year, we set a goal now to counteract deforestation for non-HP paper that's used in our products and print services by the end of the decade. And then the announcement on Tuesday of this $80 million partnership with WWF to restore and protect and improve that management of, of, of a million acres of, uh, of forest landscapes. So that's about 4,000 square miles. And this partnership then is, you know, it's going to counterbalance to the level of 17 million metric tons of paper that's used in both the commercial and consumer uh, HP printers over the next 10 years. And that's gonna allow us to make progress against this goal um, of that uh, regardless of paper brand that we're, we're counterbalancing the impact on forest resources and will help us to realize a vision for forest positive printing. That's a pledge to give back to forests more than we take. So. You know, we'll be one of the first technology companies to counteract the risk of deforestation beyond the supply chain and raise the bar on corporate leadership for nature-based solutions as a first company, as I mentioned, to pilot uh, science-based targets for forests. Um, and, and, and I think that's the area where companies really need to, you know, need to step up. It's in applying the best science, um, working collaboratively, and um, and looking to, to address impacts simply beyond their own value chains uh, when they recognize the transformative uh, opportunities that we have to work across industries uh, and drive success faster. Thanks so much. Uh, Natasha, I'll just pass it straight to you on the innovation side. What what, what are you seeing about with, with potential in, uh, in the next few years? Um, yeah, well, so first I want to say congratulations, Dave. That, that's a super exciting project. I was impressed when I saw that announcement. And, and my, my answer might surprise you, but at VMware, we always talk about trees as being our favorite technology and being the operating system for this planet that we live on. So we're super excited right now about mangroves and mangrove projects. So I don't know if you know, but these are called the wonder tree. And that's because they store four times the amount of carbon. They also have multiple co-benefits, such as providing coastal protection, supporting aquatic life, um, the list goes on. So as part of our commitment to getting trees in the ground, we recently announced our partnership with OneT.org and committed to planting and protecting, to Altera's point, um, 1 million trees by 2030. So we're focused again on getting them in the ground now as a way to take meaningful action today. And then our hope is that those will become blue carbon projects where we can potentially see them as carbon removal offsets in the future. That's excellent. Mangroves are truly the wonder tree. I think I, the science I've seen recently said about 20% of the world's mangrove forests could be funded through carbon finance. So there's a, a lot of interesting potential there. Some more work to do, but it's great to hear. It's great to hear that focus. Um, let's let's uh, shift gears just a second, and, and Altair, if I could ask you, um, just in terms of, you know, we there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of challenges out there. There's a lot of gaps we need to fill. But if you could flip a switch and, and change one thing uh, today that could benefit the expansion of credible, high quality NCS projects or uh, expand the marketplace, what what would you do? Well, you know, I, I take what uh, Lisa Jackson said to heart at the end um, of, of her comments, which is that if I could flip a switch, we would be a fossil fuel free economy. We would have a renewable energy grid. We would have electrified um, transportation and fleets. Um, we wouldn't be depending so much on nature to um, look to do all the hard work of solving climate change for us. So, you know, reducing first, I'm just gonna continue to emphasize that. But in terms of like, literally, if I could just flip a switch and have a dream come true, it would probably be um, in the insurance space and not in their own reductions, 
Um, but I'm watching this space closely because like you know, Stuart, the Nature Conservancy and Swiss Re has had some successes in actually insuring natural capital um, off of the Yucatan Pen Peninsula. In this case, it was coral reefs. But I would like to see that applied to forestry and removals, um, similar to how we insure our homes. And because everybody is insuring their homes, we're spreading the risk, we're making it affordable, and we can take action if anything goes wrong with our house. We can apply those same principles to forestry projects. Um, you know, of course, we're seeing um, the effects of climate change. Um, in addition to the effects of human consumption, but the effects of climate change are impacting forestry projects, whether it's severe weather events or wildfires. Um, and so it might be a big switch to flip, um, but it's certainly something I'm watching. I know that the industry is talking about it a lot. I know it's had some successes and I would love to see it scale so that uh, corporations and everybody feels like they're kind of de-risking their investments a little bit by all participating in the same um, insurance insurance plans for natural capital solutions. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have a switch they could like to to, to flip? Altera covered a lot of ground there, uh, but maybe there's uh, any other things anyone would want to mention? Sure, Stuart. I'm happy to share a couple of thoughts. So. Uh, certainly agree in the sense that I think on in the broader picture um, you know 100 percent you know renewable electricity and, uh, and and energy sources around the world is really really what's going to be needed um, particularly when we think about the need to decarbonize our entire upstream um, and our entire downstream when it comes to using you know um, manufactured electronic products uh, but I think a little more specific I guess I'd say to um, to looking at the area of, of natural climate solutions would be, you know, with hopes of what we have coming up next week at COP, it would really be that we see as a result, you know, determination of rules and guidance around how we're, we're going to operationalize Article 6. And then by that advance international carbon market mechanisms, that is going to help to um, improve the quantity and the quality. It's going to remove uncertainty. It's going to allow um, governments and other players to be much more active and proactive and supportive in in the financing and implementation um and it will you know start to really operationalize a lot of what's already been set out um through cop in, in mechanisms like red plus so right now i think it's really that there's a, lo a lot of lack of transparent and well-functioning markets that's impeding investment um and that then is going to impact the development of that market and so we're in a, a, a not a great loop right now and if we can begin to get uh, the clarity around those the kind of rules and guidance that's a huge step forward in my mind great great thank you all um let's uh turn it to to the audience q a we had some questions come in already and uh i will uh work these through and and and, and toss them to, to to one of you but everybody please feel free to uh to chime in at, at any moment. Um, the, the first question, Altair, I'll just I'll send it back to you if you don't mind. Uh, how can developers better characterize the co-benefits produced by their NCS project? So um, could you talk a little bit more about the co-benefit side of things? Sure, well, we've heard, you know, a couple of the panelists talk about SDG alignment. Um, that's certainly one way that, you know, we create those uh, storylines through from carbon down to other co-benefits. Um, but we also see standards solving for this as well. There's the climate, community, and biodiversity standard, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's not just measuring climate, it's community and biodiversity benefits. Um, SD Vista, um, which is actually verifying two sustainable development goals, um, standards out there like social carbon or even W plus uh, to Andrea's point, um, you know, which would measure um, gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, the gold standard kind of embedded within its methodology and protocols aligns with the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, these projects are doing so much more than just trapping carbon, whether it's uh, filtering water for downstream communities, providing cr critical habitat, um, open space and recreation. You know, I think after a year of lockdown, um, everybody is appreciating nature a whole heck of a lot and getting out there and taking a walk in the woods. Um, so, you know, more and more, we're finding that not just our companies um, kind of looking for it, asking for it, demanding it, 
but on the flip side, figuring out ways that we can actually measure, to David's point, um, what those benefits are um, in a real way. And, and, and I hope that out of COP, we see even more standards kind of come out and make announcements, particularly around biodiversity, which is one of the tougher nuts to crack. Um, so that we can measure those outcomes as well. Um, and all of it together, when you look at nature and the full kind of ecosystem services that nature is providing, the value is so much higher than just the price per ton. I think then we start to really get to the true cost and the true value of these projects. Yeah, and I would you. add, sorry. Ooh, no, go yeah. for it. Um, in speaking with these standards, we've worked with natural capital partners on one um, particular project, Dark Woods. We've worked with them since 2018, and we're super excited when Dark Woods, which is a forest improvement or forest management improvement project out of Canada, uh, became the first project in North America to be certified with this SD Vista. Uh, so very exciting there. And SD Vista, like Altera spoke to, it's really just um, a framework by which projects can be assessed on their sustainable development benefits and how they contribute to the achievement of these sustainable development goals. And specific to dark woods, um, we hit several other goals to include um, clean water and sanitation, climate action, life on land. Um, but I also want to add um, Acre, which is a new project for us. And um, it's out of the Amazon. So Acre is the westernmost state in Brazil and is 95% forested. So um, if we continue at the current rates of deforestation in this area of Brazil, that 90% goes down to 65% by 2030. So an awesome opportunity to get in on a project that is a forest conservation project. But not only that, Acre offers um, alignment with 15 of the sustainable development goals. A couple of highlights um, include zero hunger, where the local farmers have been able to increase the yield of their crops. Uh, crops local to the area include uh, corn, um, chickpeas, uh, they're also rearing organic pigs. So some exciting opportunities there as far as food sources and then good health and well-being where this project in particular has supported the facilitation of doctor's visits and refurbishing uh, four of their local clinics there. So again, we speak to the co-benefits of these projects and just an awesome opportunity um, to touch upon several of these SDGs. So open space, uh, community benefits, in, in, including medical, uh, medical care, increased ag productivity. I think it's, these are great examples of, of the multitude of different co-benefits that can exist from some of these projects. Um, we've had a couple of questions just about, well, what about, and we talked a little bit about it on the mangrove front, and Altair, you mentioned uh, REITs, but we, people are still interested in the audience about things beyond forestry. That's been kind of a theme. Uh, one of the questions actually has to do with seaweed, and maybe I'll just take that because TNC has been doing some some work on the seaweed front and integrating seaweed into restorative aquaculture projects. There's a lot of science and practical exploration yet to do on this, but uh, it's it's a super interesting area, and um, there actually are some climate benefits to seaweed when grown the right way, uh, including. Uh, marine sediment sequestration, uh, a buffer against ocean acidification, which can have a real benefit to coastal communities. And um, seaweed can be a product that replaces other products. So think about uh, an ingredient in animal feed, think about uh, an ingredient for bioplastics, um, some kinds of fiber products as well, uh, and uh, can also be a, a soil stimulant an improver for soil quality, which then has an, an added effect about sequestration. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with seaweed. There is some interesting potential there. There's just uh, some additional work and exploration to do. Does anybody else have another example of something beyond forestry that they'd like to highlight? I'm really excited to see the standards come up with methodologies for seaweed. Uh, I'm really excited to see um, the methodologies kind of evolve for blue carbon that Natasha 
uh, mentioned and get those projects to scale. Soil carbon has so much potential. If to David's point, we can figure out, you know, the best way to measure it and calculate it, um, you know, but agree nature has so many solutions for us beyond just forests. If we could figure out a way to harness it and get some forest science in there. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about the benefits and the work being done, but um, it, we'd be remiss not to mention that there is some skepticism of, of, of nature-based solutions and, and projects, uh, that it could be a form of, of greenwashing, that it actually enables one to avoid doing the hard work. Uh, and, and everybody on the panel has mentioned very explicitly the need and the hard work that's being done by your companies today on reductions. But would anyone like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know, some of the challenges from a public perception standpoint that, that, that projects like this have? Sure, Stuart, I'm, I'm happy to throw down maybe a little bit first, but definitely curious to hear the perspectives of, of, of others. Um, and I think, you know, um, it was Natasha and Andrea spoke to this at the start when they were talking about these are the commitments that the company has made for real reductions. These are the actions. This is the progress. I mean, th that's at the core is to be sure um, that there is transparency and then there's clear communication around t making commitments and taking real action uh, to, to make these reductions now to set to set reduction targets in line with science, um, to show other complementary commitments um, that that are that are demonstrating um, the strategies behind realizing those reductions, and then using um, whether again they are they're they're going to be tech based or, or nature based types of of currently largely compensation, but even removal that that's happening um, that that's complementing that other work, and whether that's happening now in order to address and achieve carbon neutrality, uh, as Natasha was talking about, that the VMware has done now for, for many years, or whether that's part of the strategy or, or and how that's part of the strategy down the road. I, it, I think it's really in, in uh, fully in that transparency. I'm, I'm reminded of a few weeks ago, it was actually um, Natural Capital Partners that put out the, the, I think it was the third of a number of studies looking at the Fortune 500 and what is the nature of commitments. And so I'm going a little bit off of memory, but one of the things, and, and essentially, for those that didn't see it, it was it was sort of it was classifying um, um, and giving a little bit of I think quality too around the nature of of a number of commitments, whether that had more historically been carbon neutrality, um, signing up for science based targets, um, committing to RE100, and then most recently it was net zero commitments. And a couple of things I took away was well, there was this interesting sort of um, piece that that Natural Capital did about well, did did. Did those net zero commitments really, were they particularly ambitious, right? Was it clear the scope that that was being put down for net zero? And how did that compare to the countries in which those com countries are headquartered? So did, did they seem particularly leading or were they sort of kind of great in the middle or were they a little bit behind? But the other thing that struck me was I was surprised that while net zero was accelerating, shouldn't we also be in a, see an acceleration in commitment to size? science-based targets and into RE100. I mean, those are the vehicles to get there. So those really should be an integral part of the strategy in, in setting and realizing net zero. Thanks, David. That, that's really helpful. Natasha, please. Um, yeah, I'll just add to all the great stuff that Dave just mentioned, but I'll say that this is a conversation that I've had for years where people question when you're buying your way out or you know purchasing carbon offsets or RECs. And I think so much of it is, well, one thing that we've done first is the third party certification, right? So I feel very supported um, by Natural Capital Partners and through the Carbon Neutral Protocol to have, to be a certified carbon neutral company with a protocol that is transparent and public and then to work with natural capital partners and other partners who we trust, who only, you know, surface up projects that are third party verified, really credible standards, et cetera. So I think the challenge is that when you get into explaining how this works, it gets so technical so quickly and it's easy to lose people. So I think coming up with a, in fact, someone recently said that simple is extraordinarily hard. Um, and if you find yourself explaining yourself, you've already lost the, the, 
<laughs> the person or, or the conversation, which is often where I find myself, right? Trying to explain. So anyway, I just think there's a lot of education to be done mm -hmm. and, and awareness that would really support this work. Because when we do let people know what's happening, for example, we, we actually had Altera do a webinar recently at VMware where we thought, let's highlight our projects. Let's talk about it. Because when people hear about the actual projects, they get super excited. We had almost a thousand people on the webinar. I mean, it was record numbers and I've never had so much positive feedback and so many people so proud of the work we're doing. And yet most often we treat it like a transaction, right? We're just buying the carbon offsets to get our carbon neutral claim. And we don't have the time to do the storytelling and the, the legitimate storytelling and the sharing of all of these co-benefits, which I'm also so appreciating this conversation around co-benefits because I feel like those are the unsung heroes. And if people understood like, the true impact, the holistic impact of, of all of these projects, um, that they would certainly be more interested and also maybe even think they're cheap, dare I say. Andrea, please. Yeah, and um, I'll just add, and Stuart, you spoke to this in your intro uh, um, to offer additional points on top of David and Natasha's outstanding points, uh, is that this is complimentary. So these are efforts that are going alongside our efforts to decarbonize as we are looking as UPS, a transportation company, to electrify our fleet. As we are looking at gaining more sustainable aviation fuel, our customers are looking for commitments to come alongside those commitments. So offsets and natural capital solutions offer an opportunity to complement the decarbonization work that our companies are already doing. It's an excellent point. Um, it, all, all three of you making extremely uh, important comments. It, Natasha, you just said something I think leads into another question from the audience, which is simple is extraordinarily hard. Um, you know, the simple concept that, that these projects should have benefits to the communities. Andrea mentioned some in, 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 in Acre in Brazil. Um, that can be hard work right on the ground negotiating the structure of these types of projects the ownership rights etc can can anyone on the panel talk a little bit about what have been some of the challenges uh, in, in doing that and, and perhaps some advice for for a good way to approach it either uh practically or conceptually sure i'll take first dab um i think that the community and stakeholder engagement, which is kind of always happening at the onset of the projects, is absolutely critical to building local capacity, um, to getting local buy-in, to ensuring that the, that the activities aren't just shifted somewhere else. That's called leakage. Um, that means that folks like us have to work closely with on the ground implementation partners. It's not natural capital partners going into a space and saying, we've got a project for you, sign here. It's those local groups that are engaging the community um, and kind of making sure that you're bringing the community along the way, that they're benefiting from it. And that filters down into the co-benefits that we've been talking about, but it's critical to the success of the project so that the communities really take ownership of it. Um, I'll just kind of say, hold your ears, tech people, um, that I do have a little bit of a concern um, when we talk about the potential of tech solutions for monitoring um, natural capital projects or nature-based solutions projects, because we've just removed that people component. I would say that those tech solutions for monitoring, if it's remote sensing, if it's satellite images or anything like that, it has to complement the engagement on the ground. It has to complement the on the ground measurements and the hard work that the community is doing and not replace it. Um, otherwise, we've just traded one problem for another, frankly. I, I think one of the things I hear frequently from my colleagues in TNC is the, the value of the patient investment that can be made on the ground in places that matter, places that are uh, uh, high on the list that we should conserve or work in these situations. And that 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 takes that energy and that concept that you're talking about out there. Does anyone else have any uh, advice for those listening about how to get involved with uh, communities, how to bring them into these types of projects? 
Well, for, for our experience, I, I would really only, at, at risk of echoing what, what Altera said, it, it's been th through having the best NGO partners we can find in order to help achieve that on the ground engagement and empowerment of local NGOs, local communities. Um, and while Andrea was talking about work in, in, in Accra, we've been uh, with WWF, again, we've been doing work in the Atlantic forest in Brazil. And, and there again, putting forward first the need to be sure that we're, we're, um, we're partnering through uh, local and regional partners to ensure that those communities are engaged and benefiting from the restoration that's happening. Um, it's just essential to be sure that, you know, we're prioritizing listening to communities, ensuring social safeguards and, and bringing about community benefits. Thank you, David. Um, we have another question that's just a little bit more on the factual side, and, and, and it is, um, what's the delta between what's currently being invested and what should be invested in, in MCS solutions? Um, I think I've seen a statistic that the market needs to increase by, you know, the supply side of 15 times what it currently is. But I'll tell you, you may, you may have a better uh, stat or two that, that shows the, the scale of what needs to be done. No, I think you're spot on, Stuart. I mean, you know, um, that 15 times, that's a big task uh, from where we are today. Um, and so, it, it, and, and I'm just, just to be soapboxed for a second, um, that is not just in planting trees and getting those removals for the future. That's ensuring that we have intact forests, that we're uh, supporting organizations like the Nature Conservancy to to get easements onto pro uh, properties to make sure that they're protected in perpetuity, to make sure that we have uh, a forest supply chain for our built environment, to make sure that we have pulp and paper and fiber that we need for our supply chains. Um, so the investment is well beyond just carbon. Um, it really is that people, planet, profit, uh, triple bottom line that we're talking about with natural capital solutions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone, have, there's one more question from the audience that I think we could just come back to, which is uh, uh, kind of, we were talking quite a bit about biodiversity, uh, but are there uh, any additional comments or any additional thoughts folks have about how companies, what would make it easier and more and facilitate greater corporate involvement, private sector investment in, in biodiversity protection? Is there anybody have any last thoughts about that? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, all of those stats that you mentioned at the opening, Stuart, um, you know, we have species going extinct at an absolutely ridiculous rate. The whole reason that I got into this space, in addition to having wonderful children, where I realized I needed to look at them and say, I knew there was a problem. I did everything I could to solve it. it my background was from a deep love for wildlife. And the more we kind of lose that connection um, to wildlife, uh, the more we lose our connection to nature, the more we lose our connection to these large scale environmental challenges that we have. So the more that we can protect, you know, biodiversity hotspots, protect uh, native, existing native forests um, so that we don't have to replant them. Um, and then I'll add again, a little bit on the soapbox, but making sure that we also have working forests that are sustainably managed so that our dependency on these wood-based products um, has a source, a supply source, and keeps us from going and deforesting other places that are critical um, habitat for biodiversity. So just do it. You know, we, we, you can wait for the standard to come out. You can buy a metric ton if that's what you want to do. You can plant trees, um, but we need this yesterday. Yeah, it's work. Oh, go ahead, David. Well, Stuart, I, actually, I, I was going to say, I, I think that when we're thinking about companies, I think Andrea put her finger on it earlier when she talked about stories. And I and I think I found that, you know, often when companies talking about carbon emissions reductions and, you know, and, and like think it was uh, 
maybe it was Andrea too who said, you know, getting lost in the complexity of science-based targets. It's when you can look at these projects and you can look at the impact on communities and on wildlife. And, and here we're talking about biodiversity, but what does that mean? What does that really look like on the ground? That becomes powerful storytelling to brands. That becomes the way to engage with their customers, especially consumers, and help the consumers through their actions to make choices that are contributing to natural climate solutions. Yeah, also, I'll, I'll, I'll just add, you know, the advantage of, of nature-based solutions and trees is that they're super tangible. So to what Dave was just saying, like people can really get their heads around what this looks like and the value of it. Um, I think you're also just making me think of this sort of mindset shift that has been happening and needs to happen, which is around uncertainty and not knowing the perfect solution or not knowing how we're going to get there. So for me, it was a great exercise when we developed our science-based targets where we had to tell our executives to sign off on a science-based target that we actually didn't know how we were going to achieve. And actually that we couldn't do it by ourselves, but they, we were gonna count on other industries and other players to partake. So I think that's part of it too. So yeah, what Altera said about just do it. And for us, it's about taking action now and doing what you can. Thank you very much. You know, it's, I think it's also worth mentioning the, the biodiversity uh, negotiations that are going on this year and, and into next year in, in Kunming and uh, the potential that lies there. And it's great to see more companies getting engaged in that uh, by a different consortia and different platforms. Uh, so that that's something, I mean, the, the amount of public funding and the amount of policy change that can be had when it comes to accomplishing conservation, the 30% target, et cetera, is, is really profound. And, and, and the private sector has a has an important voice there. Um, this has been a really fantastic discussion. We're almost out of time. And so I thought at the end, we could just uh, turn it back to each of you and, and ask the very simple question of, is there anything that you didn't say that you wanted to say or anything that you'd like to leave the uh, audience with as we as we wrap up? Uh, David, can, I'll just go clockwise around my screen. I'll start with you. Um, well, the one, one of the things that's going to stick with me, I think, is when, when Natasha used that phrase of simple is extraordinarily hard. But uh, that's gonna, I don't know if that's a good thought to have. But maybe in that vein, and what I've you know heard folks say is I'd say that you know as companies, and as a global community, we need to focus on what we need to do today that will set us up for success and yield the results required in 20, in, in 10 and 20 years time. And natural climate solutions are projects that take that kind of time. I mean, so is decarbonizing, you know, decarbonizing the supply chain. So is shifting business models to be more sustainable. So my final thought is, you know, take the long view, start the journey today. There's no time to lose. Altera. Uh, I'll just take my 30 seconds to, to say thank you. Uh, Climate Leadership Conference did a great job from pivoting from in-person uh, to online. Uh, so thanks for that shift. Stuart, to you and the Nature Conservancy for all the hard work that uh, your organization is doing on the ground and for moderating the planet. Um, Dave, Natasha, Andrea, some of the best clients ever uh, really taking a leadership role in this space. Um, and of course, I don't know if she's still watching, but thanks to Lisa Jackson for kicking us off. <laughs> Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to steal Altera's just do it. Uh, so <laughs> wherever you are in your sustainability journey, maybe you aren't among the corporate commitments of an Apple, HP, VMware, UPS, but wherever you are in your journey, just do it. Um, every drop in the water helps. Natasha. Uh, I'll also say thank you. Uh, what a delight to spend this hour with all of you. And I have to attribute that quote to our new CTO, Kit Colbert. Um, he said that recently in a meeting and it really stuck with me. Um, but I've already said it in different ways, but let's not let perfection be the enemy of progress. So there's always uncertainty, but there is action that we can take now and it'll support us toward a more sustainable, equitable, and secure future. So take the long view, act, act, make progress, act. And that's the key messages I got uh, from that from that wrap up. And I hope uh, everyone watching today has uh, 
gleaned a, a number of uh, useful takeaways and, and good information from this panel. I know I certainly did. I'd like to thank each of you for, for your participation and uh, uh, the really succinct and great comments that you made. And uh, we'll turn it back over to the organizers and thanks everybody for participating. Uh, thank you so much, Stuart, Altera, David, Andrea, and Natasha for an engaging discussion. Really appreciate it. I learned a lot today and I hope all of you did too. As we wrap for the day, I'd like to thank a few more sponsors for their support. Silver Sponsors, WSP, in Edison International, Train Technologies, The Nature Conservancy, DTE, Volvo Group, and PSEG, and to our climate impact sponsor, Natural Capital Partners. To those in the audience, thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you in a few weeks as the Climate Leadership Series continues. Our next two sessions are November 17th with a workshop on climate risk, opportunity, and disclosure, and November 18th, we'll host a conversation on transforming the built environment through smart technology and innovation. And to those attending COP, safe travels. We look forward to connecting with you all next month.